it's been a very difficult year for a lot of active managers because you've had these seven stocks do the, the lead out for you. And they've been the ones that have the biggest attribution. They're the largest mega cap micro um, market cap names. And so they've done the majority of the heavy lifting in the, in the, if you look at the nitty gritty of uh, internally, uh, there are more stocks down for the year than up in a lot of the different indices. So it's been really skewed. And usually every year you get around three or four decent buying opportunities and you have these swings. And we really haven't had that this year, but I think we're developing one right now where we're going to get another bounce. I think it'll bounce and it'll be a lower high bounce and then we'll go lower after that. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. As we head into the final quarter of 2023, where are the markets likely to go next? The dramatic run-up in stocks seen in the first half of the year has run out of steam. Is the peak for the year behind us or will stocks power higher into December? And bond prices continue dropping. U.S. Treasuries look on track to log their first consecutive three-year decline in market history. Is there any hope of a reversal anytime soon? In uncertain times like these, it's wise to tap the counsel of those with decades of long-term success in the markets. So today, we'll ask these questions of Thomas Thornton, former portfolio manager, senior trader, technical analyst, and now founder of Hedge Fund Telemetry. Tom, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, Adam, how are you? I'm great, Tom. Um, always wonderful to have you on the program. Thanks for taking time out of your trading day to speak with us here. Um, lots to talk about. Um, a lot of uncertainty, as I just mentioned there in the intro. Real quick, before we dive fully into it, I got two questions for you. Let me start with the first one. Um, it's the general question I ask everybody just to kind of kick off these discussions. What's your current assessment of the global economy and financial markets? I think the economy is slowing across the world. We see it clearly in China. And I think you're seeing it in Europe as well. And in the US, we're starting to see signs of slowdown. Some consumer deterioration is happening. And I think the risk is in early 2024, we'll start to have a lot more comments about a recession. And the recession that everybody's predicted for the last two years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, really the big risk. And we also are facing 2024's political landscape, which I think will remain very precarious. Okay, so slowing economy, um, dawning next year, recession ahead, markets probably react to that at, you know, at some point uh, along the way, and then increasing political uh, instability, precariousness you mentioned. Okay, um, I want to talk about how you take that outlook and then trade based on it. Um, we talked a little bit about this the last time you were on the channel, but I just want to revisit for folks who didn't benefit from that video, um, which is uh, you, well, you you have a very definite approach to how you look at the markets and trade. If you could just describe that briefly, like your methodology for people, and in your answer, if you can explain what DeMarc indicators are, because I believe those are a pretty important tool in your toolbox. Well, I do have a fairly large toolbox, and I know when to weigh certain indicators a little bit more, depending on where we are in the market cycle. And so I look at market sentiment first and foremost. I use the daily sentiment index data on our site. We chart every single day uh, where market sentiment is for 46 different markets, and that's stocks, bonds, currencies, and commodities. And I think that I have a pretty good macro top-down focus, uh, but I come from a long short hedge fund. I currently have a long short hedge fund, but we look at basically US equities and I focus more on large cap equities. And that's just uh, my background. I also use DeMarc indicators and simply DeMarc indicators use an exhaustion method that Tom DeMarc created way back in the 70s. Uh, they tend to work pretty well in all different market conditions. And there's also times when they don't work. And that is telling you something in itself that a trend is very, very strong. And what's interesting is when I have these signals on my screen, 
I can identify when we get to potential bottoms and also potential tops. And it's not just one signal in itself, it's more that I look and I screen within the S&P 500 for buy countdown 13s, for example, or sell countdown 13s. And I'm currently starting to see more buy countdown 13s develop. And right. sorry, just to define to these, for people, a, a, a buy okay. countdown 13 means what? That's that's basically there. There's two parts of the Demarc indicators. There's the first, which is a setup, and those go. You see them on my charts on, on Twitter when I put them out. There, a setup uh, goes one through nine, and you have to have nine consecutive days. For example, on the upside, closing higher than the bar four bars previous, and right. that has to go in a sequential pattern. Once you get that nine then a sequential can start. And those are the red numbers. And those go up to 13. Those don't actually have to go in sequential order, which makes a little, doesn't really make a lot of sense since it's called the sequential. But when you get the 13, that is basically exhausting on the downside sellers or on the upside buyers. So the on the upside, it's the last buyer has bought. And on the downside, the last seller has sold. It's not that you have new you know, a new influx of sellers that come in at the highs, you just run out of buyers and they work really, really well. And for example, we had in July for the first time this year, the S&P had sell countdown 13s occur in the S&P. The NASDAQ has been a little bit more difficult and we can go through that uh, more in detail later. But basically what we have now is we have the sell countdown 13s at the highs and now we're coming down and we are getting close to new buy countdown 13s that uh, could develop into a bounce. And so that's what I'm watching right now. I'm currently net short, but I am starting to scale into some long ideas. And uh, I'm really not a perma bear or bull. I'm just sort of an opportunist that looks for different ideas at different swings in the market. And this has been, I'll get a little into the market here. It's been a very difficult year for a lot of active managers, because you've had these seven stocks do the, the lead out for you. And they've been the ones that have the biggest attribution. They're the largest mega cap micro um, market cap names. And so they've done the majority of the heavy lifting. And the, in the, if you look at the nitty gritty of uh, internally, uh, there are more stocks down for the year than up in a lot of the different indices. So it's been really skewed. And usually every year you get around three or four decent buying opportunities and you have these swings. And we really haven't had that this year, but I think we're developing one right now where we're gonna get another bounce. I think it'll bounce and it'll be a lower high bounce and then we'll go lower after that. So I've kind of given you my playbook for the rest of the year. All right, great. So uh, you, you've seen weakness in the market. You were net short, you are net short still but you're now beginning to see these buy countdown 13s that may be setting the market up for a, a bounce here. Um, I, I'm, so I'm curious, you know, looking at these indicators that you were talking about, you know, like what are they telling you about the major indices? Uh, right before we hopped on here, I looked at your Twitter account and as you maybe just intimated, you said um, you're seeing some concerning DeMarc indicators um, with both the S and P and the Nasdaq right now. So, anyways, what is what is your TA telling you? Or I shouldn't say TA, but what is your analysis telling you? Well, how about I just put up my screen here and we can just go through it and I Even can better. show you really quickly. I'm not going to go through too far into the Demarc indicators because I think everybody will be like, "What the hell is he talking about?" No, but, but to this... look over a master's shoulder is awesome. Yeah. So, um, so this is my this is my S and P cash index chart. And there's a there's a couple things on here that I will talk about, and there's some that I just don't think that uh, are that relevant. But the main thing is, up here, uh, back in July, we had a, this red 13, which is a sequential countdown 13, and this purple is a combo 13. They're very similar in nature of how they work, but they basically look for upside exhaustion. So we we. When you have these signals here, you should, generally should see a market reversal or a stall at least within the next 10 to 12 bars. And we did have a reversal down. Uh, this is a setup nine. So you had these nine uh, countdowns in a row here. 
And we went a little further and it's hard to see, but there's a little one here. And I like wave theory a lot. And I think wave theory, a lot of people, they, their eyes go gl glossy when they start hearing about Elliott wave. But I think the one thing about th that is that the personalities of each wave are really the most important and telling thing of what's happening within those waves. So if I can identify what wave we're in, uh, it really gives me a, a pretty good idea. And I'll show you right now. We bounced up here, we made a lower high wave two. And usually when we're going up this way here, people keep thinking on, on you know, you'll read it on Twitter or, or hear it on TV, that oh, we're gonna go back to all time highs and the bullishness is still there. But what's happened is we've moved back down and we're now in wave three. We broke this recent one wave. And now people are starting to get a little bit nervous. Uh, the fundamentals are starting to get a little bit more dicey and we're moving down. And now if you look closely, there's a red 10 of 13. And that's something that I'm watching right now for the 13. So we need a little bit further downside to go. And the waves that Tom DeMarc created, I love because it gives you some price objectives that uh, are computer automated. So we have a price objective of 42.34 on the S&P. This is for wave three. Now what comes after wave three is another bounce and it's another lower high bounce. Will not go above the 45.30 level. And then we'll fail and go lower into downside wave five. Once you're in wave five, everybody knows it's a, it's a bear market or it's a dangerous market and people start to get on board that it's, going much lower. So those are the personalities just sort of briefly on the, the waves that I'm looking that, at right now. That's this super interesting. And if I can just interject real quickly yeah. um, with some additional and out technical analysis that some other recent guests who have had in this program have said where they have looked at history. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking of Darius Dale, who I just had on the program uh, just a couple of days before the recording of this one, Tom. And he basically looks at the performance of stocks um, leading up to a recession. And historically, the, the the 12 months leading up to the start of a recession uh, tend to outperform, tend to be outperforming. It, it tends to be it's an outperform true. year. And uh, more than 50% of that outperformance happens in the last three months before uh, the recession hits. So as he and I were sort of colloquializing it, you know, the, the party gets uh, at its most raging right before the cops show up. Um, <laughs> That's a good way of putting it. I don't Sven know anything Henrik, about Spen that. Sven Henrik and Lance, Lance Roberts have also brought additional data to suggest, not necessarily you know, hang their hat on, but to suggest that stocks could run through the rest of this year, surprising the bears that are looking at all of the bearish fundamental data, right? And saying, mm -hmm. I can't believe we don't have recession yet. We're obviously going to have one at some point. These guys don't disagree with the fundamental data, but they say they can make a technical case for stocks to run up from here, you know, for the next couple months. And I'm just looking at what you've, you've mapped out for us here. And it looks like if the DeMarc waves do proceed as usual, we're near the bottom for wave three. There will be a, a you know, a, a, a wave four up cycle um, yeah. that will get us back you know, to, to the mid 400s or so. Um, which could get us through, you know, the rest of the year ish. Um, and then, you know, the big wave five starts. And I'm guessing that wave five would take us, you know, well into Q1, Q2 of next year. And I, I we don't know the exact yeah, that, timing. So but. so I'll give you the, I'll give you something that's a little bit um, you know, you always get these people that talk about the the analogs with 19. Oh, it's got the 1987 pattern and all, all these different things. And there's there's some validity to that because what generally happens is you get this, you can still see my screen, right? Yep. Okay. So you get this first move down and then you make a lower high and then you break the wave three level. And when you, when you break this level here and we're getting lots of new 20 day lows and, and one month rolling period lows that are happening. And, and even though the S and P is down about, it's probably down around one and a half percent, two percent below this August low you have a significant amount of S&P stocks that are down from that period. I think there's, I think there's um, about 180 stocks that are still above 
that level. And that's, you know, and the rest are down below that. So in 1987, you had a lower high bounce and then you went lower. And when you broke this level here, you really saw, I mean, there was a lot of, you know, the machines took over and such. And those that's a whole nother story. But you really start, you see this pattern break and people get motivated to sell. They want to protect their profits. And if you haven't had a new high since July, uh, it's been a while since people are seeing ma making money in the market and that will, could give them some impetus to sell. So I wouldn't be shocked to see something a little bit more dramatic and maybe 4,100 or 4,000 mm -hmm. on the S&P is possible. But before, but I, the, again, the, before the wave four? Yeah. And then the wave four is going to be, a. I, it, it needs basically the technical aspect that you need a 13 day closing high off the mm -hmm. low and, you know, we'll, we'll We'll cross that bridge when we get there. But the fact is that uh, th this is the type of pattern that that really spooks people. And I can go back and I can I can I, I can scroll back to 1987 and show the exact same pattern. The DeMarc signals gave us sell signals. And uh, when we broke that that wave three or into wave three, uh, we really fell really hard. And uh, that was a wave three crash as well. So I'm not necessarily predicting a crash, but I think something that could happen pretty significantly. So that's something I'm watching right now. And I'll 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 pop this up here too. Hold on. Let me This is the other part of the story that really concerns me. And it's the bond market. And the one thing I I I I'll, I'll be straight I my year in the equity market has been sort of flat all year and I've underperformed last year was a great year. The year before was a great year. Uh, as I like to say, the year's not over. Yeah. You had a but, ridiculous year last year, didn't you? Yeah, it was. Yeah. It, again, it was because you had these, you know, these waves that you had these, these pullbacks that we could exploit sentiment got really beat up and you could buy them. But what's causing me some concern and I've been bearish on the bond market all year and you've had like this is what's interesting you have a 13 here you get a minor pullback uh and then you know a new countdown can start and it, a new countdown starts because you get the setup nine and then another setup nine and then another setup nine and another one and another one and when you have that that's telling you the trend is very very strong and it's not necessarily that you know a lot of people you know they 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 don't understand the mark indicators and they don't understand that that it, it's not 1987 after a signal that everything's going to go down 10% or 20% right after that. They could just stall out for a while. And that's something that, that happens all the time. But when you see these indicators recycle and go higher, that tells me that we're at risk. And, and here we are on day 12 of 13 here with the 10-year. And this is a what we call a propulsion. So you're at 4.588 as a target and i've had that target for the last week and it's done pretty well there but the risk is that bonds come unleashed and break down and rates go higher and there's a bond capitulation and one thing that um i i i'll uh, hold on, let me see if i can get this it says arc inflows but i i grabbed this chart off bloomberg but what i think is really interesting right now is that we've had these huge, hold on, we've had these huge inflows into the bond market. And a lot of it's been short term. Obviously, you're getting a yield. I mean, two years ago, if you were getting 15 basis points or 20 basis points on your two year, you're probably like, this really sucks. And now you're getting five plus percent and right. it makes a lot of sense. And I, I, I'm, I, I, I'll get, I get so many people constantly ask me when can we buy when can i buy tlt and yeah. i'll tell you one of the problems that tlt and i'll i think this is cool that i can share this hold on if i can find my chart i have lots of charts <laughs> uh where's my inflow right. chart but here's the thing that's really kind of interesting uh here you go so i i ignore the arc inflow i grabbed this up bloomberg but this is basically tlt and this is a weekly, but let's go to a monthly. Hold on. All right. And and this is a chart of weekly. You're now moving to monthly inflows. Yeah. 
So this okay. is um, this is the, this is the TLT monthly inflows outflows. So inflows outflows, and August when we spoke we spiked to new highs. Uh, we we saw the first outflows since this big bar here was March of 22. This is when the Fed started raising rates off zero. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've had this huge amount of inflows and the TLT is down about 37% since then. And what really is concerning is that when you have these crowded long positions, you have a risk of rates going higher and people say, no mas, I'm out of TLT. It sucks. I'm out of bonds. It's not working. There's no recession. I mean, people thought back in March of 22 that, that you know, bonds were a great buy. They weren't. And as we see, um, this is still, we're still up for September for inflows, but you never know with the uh, rates uh, the last couple, couple days of the year. So that's kind of okay. what I'm watching right now. And sorry, just bring that back up for one sec, Um, because I I just want to summarize it for people who are watching on a podcast. Um, So if you can pull it back up, if not, I'll just try to do it from memory. But it looks like every month from kind of, you know, maybe September-ish of 2001 since has been a positive month of inflows into TLT, with the single exception of the month before this current one. So August, right? Right. Um, that that's exactly that, let me if i can find it i always yeah lose. and, uh, well, and the, the, what i just want to let them know because i think it's really important like you said which is, is. tlt has been struggling <laughs> despite <laughs> all of these inflows and and looking at these inflows they are historically larger than the inflows certainly the net inflows into tlt in the previous two years right so kind of with all this support tlt has still been kind of disappointing and you're yeah. you're saying there's a risk here of tlt investors or you know long-term treasury investors. I mean, here's another one. This is a broken thesis and I'm out of here. So one of the problems of why a lot of things never rebound to their old highs. So this is ARC. This is the ARC fund. Uh, This goes back to 2018. And as you see in 2020 and Tesla going crazy and Kathy Wood on TV every other day. Uh, and sorry, just to be clear, inflows. this is this this is the real inflows for ARC. Which yes. <laughs> earlier you had you had said ARC, but it was TLT. Now this is actually yeah. ARC, right? I, I do, okay. I, sometimes I grab something off Bloomberg, a, a really good chart, and I can't get rid of the script. You know, I, I've got too much to do to like play around with some of the script. But this is the ARC inflows here and outflows. And one of the reasons when you and this is kind of why it, it really sort of speaks with bonds as well. When you have these like trapped buyers up there, you're not going to get them to get whole. I don't see the TLT going up 37. Well, it's going to have to go up more than 37%. But to get back to those old levels, I think it's going to be fairly impossible. And the same thing with ARC. You just, you're losing people. Um, and it's, you know, this ARC is $38 and it's not going back to 150 anytime soon, even though everybody thinks it will but there are a lot of trapped people in here and they still haven't gotten out so that's kind of arc for that matter and truth be told i am short arc currently i was shorted at the highs too and i i reshorted it um not too long ago okay so let's get rid of this chart keep the the bond market one behind it that you have there um yep. so let me ask you you're, you're you're nervous about the treasury market you've been bearish you said all year on it I, I, that trade i'm guessing has worked out well for you um uh i, I guess two questions for you one uh do you kind of have a target whether it's based upon the mark indicators or some other type of ta of where you think you the 10-year yields may peak uh and then secondly we're going to have i think as i mentioned in the intro a historically unprecedented third down year in in treasuries this year it looks like unless something magical happens quickly. Do you yeah, expect so here's, that, that? Here's something we'll that a, I watched. Do you expect we'll have a fourth year in 2024? I don't like to go out that far, and it won't take yeah. much for this to be a positive year, considering where we are. So again, I, I look at daily market sentiment, um, uh, daily, daily sentiment index. Uh, this guy, Jake Bernstein in San Francisco, 
1987 started polling investors. And uh, these are not necessarily the Paul Tudor Joneses and Ray Dalios, but they're just average investors. And they he asks, are you bullish or bearish? And I like basically asking that question rather than saying, are you neutral? Because neutral sends a message of, I don't want to make a decision here. I don't right. want to be wrong. It's the wishy-washy what, what, Yeah. So what, what I'm looking at right here is this is the sentiment. And we track it every single day. And it goes from 100%. If you're super bullish, it's 100% um, or it goes to zero. And currently, we're at 11% bulls. And last year, uh, when rates were hitting new highs, uh, we moved down to 7%. And one thing that's really important for people to understand when they read sentiment polls or other things, sentiment is a condition. It can and, st and, can and might stay overbought or oversold for a period of time. And it's not a trigger. So you need other triggers. And I use the mark indicators on that as well. So the thing is, is if you get this condition here where it's oversold, <clears throat> it might just stay oversold and go higher. So this is the this is the yield on the 30 year. It's got, it went higher. It got oversold. This last year, I think it hit 7%, uh, which, which is pretty overdone. But uh, I think what I like to see here is this red line is a 20 day moving average of bullish sentiment and it's still sloping down. So when you start to see it move up, that's a bullish signal. So you wanna see some, you can be a little late to the party, but get the trade right. And that's what I've been watching. And so if you look at here since May, uh, it's been basically straight down. And that that to me, <clears throat> we, could get a, we could get a reversal and a reversal could come if there's, let's just say a big risk off moment in the equity market Mm -hmm. Where people get freaked out, they think, oh, my God, we're going to go into recession. I need safety. They're going to just buy bonds. But sometimes in bear markets, you don't have any safe place to hide. You can't go to gold because people are going to sell anything that's not nailed down. They'll sell gold. They'll sell bonds. I mean, when, when stocks and bonds are selling off together, that's a nasty mix. So I just, you know, I think that's kind of where we are right now. And if we get some sort of dramatic move lower... That could be the capitulation. Okay, um, I want to I want to grab onto both those points, and then I want to get to some specific stocks that I know you've been tracking of late that are kind of representative of the markets. Um, so, back to my question about let, let's say we get the capitulation in bonds that you fear we could get. Right, I'm not saying you're right. saying it's going to happen, but just you're afraid that it could happen. That's true. Where, where do you think the ten year could go in, in the type of capitulation that you're thinking of? 4.75 above mm -hmm. five higher like what's what's you worse? know the <clears throat> I I think everybody freaks out with round big round numbers so <clears throat> let's just say the 30 year is at 467 now 454 on the 10 year <clears throat> excuse me if we get to if we move to five percent <clears throat> I think everybody's going to start to freak out I mean we got to four percent and the market freaked out in in March and that 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 could happen again you also have all these regional banks that freaked out in the end of February when we hit 4% and we've gone higher and all of them holding long bonds. If they bought two years ago and that's just in their balance sheet, they're down 50% in their capital. And I had a pretty interesting conversation with uh, an investment banker who specializes in working with financial institutions, a lot of regional banks. And he told me, because I asked him, I said, do we need, do, do these banks need to raise capital? And he said, every single bank needs to raise capital. He said, the problem is they're afraid to do it. They don't want to raise capital because the hedge funds will short the living hell out of them. And the people that give money to banks in those situations, they don't want to be the first one in. They want to be the last one in. Uh, so there's yeah, this. And, and sorry risk. to interrupt, but the, the banks would short the hell out of them because by raising capital, the bank is basically signaling well, no, the, trouble. I'm like hedge them. funds, hedge funds will will short them, and they'll be you know run on the bank, and you know everybody's right. but, but, you know. But, but they, it's, they, it, it, it short them because by the by saying I need capital, the bank is saying I'm in a weak position, and that's where the hedge fund that, that that's the blood in the water that the hedge fund. Yeah, that's smell. the blood in the water, and hedge funds will will pounce all over it, and so they're all just sort of trying to lay low right now. And I think that, you know, you had the Fed come in and the Treasury come in and basically try, you know, try to bring some stability 
back in March and they did. But if this starts to happen a little bit more and you have these banks that do need capital, and again, this is a very senior level investment banker telling me this, I take him and he's generally a pretty positive guy and, you know, Mm -hmm. yeah, everything's going to be fine. But he was really concerned about this. And so that could be sort of a, another catalyst down, down the road that could happen. And if, again, if we hit a round number 5% on the 10 or the the 30, I think that's, that's a real risk. And you, you also have central banks that hold a lot of us debt. You also have, you know, from pension funds that, you know, the, People are in from the institutional side or the central bank side or retail. We all, you know, put our pants on the same way and they all have emotions and they all have risk that they get to a certain places where they they can panic. And that is certainly a possibility. All right. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask this question one more time just because you're, you're making this topic even more and more interesting for me. So you said that if we get to a big round number like five, then people will freak out. Um, does that mean that yields will then go even higher above five on the 30 year treasury because of the freak out factor? And if so, what does that add onto it? Does that add another, does it 30 year at six, 30 year at higher or? Cause I just want to say to your point about banks, 30 year at five is already enough gravity in the system to probably start causing more banks to fail and ne- requiring the Fed and Treasury to increase the BTFP or launch another funding vehicle. Yeah. That that's that's the risk. And you know, in some regards it would probably get, you know, there's two things that are going to get the Fed to pivot and and cut rates and that's going to be some sort of large market dislocation. And that could be the bond market, that could be the equity market, most likely both. There could be, you know, some liquidity plumbing problems that happen, or unemployment starts to spike. And one thing that I think will happen is if the equity markets start to really weaken, you will start to see unemployment go up. Because sure. remember last year, at the end of last year, you saw all these tech companies laying off people. They laid off people in droves and that actually improved their performance this year. And that's partly why some of them like Meta have done pretty well, but they lay off people when their stocks are at lows and that's what will happen. And we've had the equity market sort of elevated and that's maybe why you haven't seen the labor market deteriorate that much. And so that's just another thing that the Fed could could start to pivot, but, I'm in the higher for longer camp right now because I think inflation is still going to remain pretty elevated, especially with the resurgence in energy prices. You've had gasoline move up a fairly significant amount. And I'm looking at the average retail gas price. We're Yeah, we're still at 384 on the U.S. unleaded uh average gas price. If we moved over 4%, then you're going to start to see people on the news talking about it. And so you haven't really seen that yet, but that's a possibility. And and energy is a late cycle type of asset that moves. And if you have higher energy costs for consumers, it's going to take more of their savings. And I think consumers with all the data that you've seen have pulled back or starting to pull back, not necessarily in all segments. The high end still is pretty fine. And that will cause some real, real problems. And again, I don't think you have a government in the U S that's, that's really prepared for that. I think they're, they're sort of in la la land. And, uh, right. and, and, and that ties that rising inflation driven by input cost increases, like the price of oil that further ties the fed's hand, right? Cause the fed, obviously its job is to tame inflation, right? Right. And and you also you're also going to see labor costs go up. You you have all these unions that are demanding higher wages. And in many cases, they are, you know, the workers are due higher wages. I think that that makes sense. Some of the demands are a little bit egregious, in my opinion, but you're going to see higher wages on the auto workers. You're start you're going to see them uh for some of the, the entertainment people. Not I'm not talking about you know the actors and 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 writers, but you're going to see it go down the the 
levels to where the caterers are going to make more money. The, the, the makeup people are going to make more money. <clears throat> Set designers are going to make more money. And, and that's going to happen um, as the strikes in Hollywood get, get settled. And, and that will add to the wage pressure. Okay. So um, you, you, you're basically setting up, you know, kind of a gloomy outlook for the markets from here. Um, and, and I want to, I want to sort of delineate between what may happen later this year versus what may happen in 2024 and beyond. But it sounds like you think we're going to have to be higher for longer. Uh, the risk of recession is, is substantial. We'll say uh, the risk of a, of a, market correction, maybe even a market dislocation is high enough to not be dismissed, right? Correct me if I'm putting any inappropriate words in your mouth here. Um, so uh, you, you, I think you said earlier, like there's a chance that we could be there now where both stocks and bonds kind of jump off the cliff. I just want to clarify for folks. I don't necessarily think you think that's the most probable next wave of the market. Um, and when you were going back to the, the DMARC waves, um, it, it did seem to me that you thought it was probably more probable that a wave four would, would come at some point in the next couple of months. Right. Is that correct? Or do you have a different outlook than what I just said? Because no, what I, I want to do is necessarily get folks to know, take look, the impression. I, you think it's all yeah. going to hell tomorrow. Yeah. Well, it could all go to hell tomorrow. It could. <laughs> I don't know. It could, uh, yeah. You know, when you when you break certain levels, you know, you really risk the 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 risk of a dislocation exponentially grows and that's just human nature you see new lows on something you're going to have more sellers and people get panicky when they start losing money and and the day traders that have been buying the dip and all these things they're starting to get worn out and that's sort of the cycle of what happens when you're going down and i hate being gloomy if i could just be really honest i hate being gloomy because i i like finding lows and i've been trying to find and and buy ideas and, and places that I see as oversold and I'll start to, you know, inch my way in. And I'm really particular about the sizing. I'll, I'll, I'll buy small sizes at, at certain places. Uh, so that's, there's going to be a bounce. And when that bounce happens, I think it's going to be a relief, but I think it's going to be short lived. I think earnings are going to start to become a little bit more difficult. And Again, look at a company like Apple. Great company, one of the best companies in the world in our lifetime. They have a problem because they have not grown for the last three quarters. And sorry, I really sorry to interrupt. Don't... I want to I'll make sure folks understand. It's not they haven't grown their their earnings in the past several quarters. It's they haven't grown their revenues. Right, right. That's that's a problem. And and iPhone sales have have really sort of topped out. <clears throat> The problem with Apple is that they make great phones and people don't necessarily need to go out and spend $1,200 or more to buy a new phone. And, and you, there, one thing I will tell you is when you start to see the subsidies from the carriers, from AT&T and Verizon and others, they're, they're saying basically, we'll give you a new phone if you trade in your old one. And they're, they're trying every trick in the book to sell more phones. And I think that's necessarily a sign of weakness. And Apple's a great company. Again, they have a problem in China. Uh, that's a big problem if, if they start to restrict or tell their consumers and the people that work at the state-owned enterprises and the government to not buy Apple phones. You can't use your Apple phone through um, when you're working. And that could be a problem for Apple. And China's a huge market and every little tick matters. And and Apple's another good example. It's the stock had earnings not so great. Stocks come down. The new iPhone came out. This sort of oh, it's got a new little button here, and it's basically the same thing of what if you upgraded last year or the year before. But if they break 170, which they're not so far away from, I think that's going to motivate people to sell Apple even harder. And I think you can see it back to 150. And that's a pretty substantial decline from this level. So it's, it, is, it is. And it's hard for a massive whale like Apple to have that kind of price correction without weighing on the, the major indices just because it's well, so it's heavily the largest, owned, right? Yeah, it's the largest weight. And 
you know, you, I think I think only three of the magnificent seven are still above the August the August lows, and the, one of them is Tesla. That's another one that I have. I have a short position in Tesla and I trade it. So it's not like I've had a short position since, you know, 2017, I, I trade around it and I traded it well last year, covered it pretty much on the lows and started to add back in the two hundreds. And I think they have a demand problem right now and they keep cutting prices of all their cars. And they've really sort of created a price war with themselves. Their average car is down 26% year to date from their price they, they've cut prices on everything to move metal okay. sorry let me just let me make sure we all understand that you're saying the average tesla car sold its price has dropped 26 percent from the beginning of the year yep wow yep. yeah and on top of it the government is giving out this ira subsidy if you meet this certain criteria which is substantial it's like 7500 dollars for per car so it's, there's a lot of motivation for people to buy Teslas, but I think they're they're running into a problem where the cars are a little stale in design and they're making a little tweak here and there, new bumpers and a new inside or whatever. It's not anything that's going to necessarily move the needle here. And so if they have to cut prices and have a price war against themselves to sell more cars, I think they have a problem. But the real problem, I think, for Tesla and I, I'm going to say this, and I'm going off of a little bit of experience from this. Um, recently, they just the Wall Street Journal had a story, two stories actually, within a month, about how the DOJ and the Southern District of New York is investigating Elon Musk and Tesla for some unauthorized purchases, and these vary from this, you know, glass house that was rumored that Tesla was going to build Elon near the factory and some other things. But what what the bulls will say is, oh, it's a nothing burger. It doesn't really matter. It's nothing. It does. And I'll tell you why. Uh, first of all, when I saw the DOJ, and I know the SEC's got all sorts of investigations on them as well, and that, that, that may be a nothing burger in itself. But when the Southern District of New York gets involved, you have to remember who they are. They are hardcore prosecutors that look for securities fraud. And securities fraud, what they're looking for are unauthorized purchases for a CEO for items that were not approved in a, you know, a 10K uh, or 8K, I think 8K, uh, where it says we're giving our CEO this. You have to have that disclosed. And Disclosure, if it's not yeah. disclosed, it's a problem. As much as people think it's a nothing burger, remember Dennis Kozlowski from Tyco from early 2000s, he had Tyco buying him lots of different things from artwork to perks and gold, gold toilets. toilets say, something like that. It was crazy. And he went to jail. He went to jail. He, he had a huge fine. They went after Mike Milken. Mike Milken in the late 80s was bigger than anybody on Wall Street anybody. He was the most powerful man on Wall Street by far. And he went to jail and he paid a $550 million fine and he's still friggin' rich. Okay. They went after him. They got him. They know how to do this. And for the Wall Street Journal to have this story and for them to basically put it out there, this is very serious. They have a grand jury convened right now in September and this is not necessarily a civil issue. This is a criminal investigation. So let's just go through this and, and think about it. If, let's just say, this, this, this glass house is their, their Trojan horse, we want more disclosure. We want to see every single thing that Tesla's done and spent on since 2017. And that's basically what they're saying. If there's anything in there, they can indict Elon Musk or say, you know, somebody within Tesla. It gets worse because a year ago when Bloomberg brought up this story about these unauthorized purchases for this very special thick glass, I would imagine, 
uh, a, an internal lawyer at Tesla brought up this issue. And it was in Bloomberg and this lawyer, his name, I forgot. He was fired a month later by Tesla. He's gone. Now, let's remember too, Tesla's CFO quit unexpectedly in the, at the end of July, right after their earnings report. He was gone. Within a weekend, gone. He was really well liked. The street loved him. I think Elon really liked him. But something happened there. The Wall Street Journal, the second one, mentioned his name as one person who also brought up the unauthorized purchase purchases for Elon Musk. So if the, the Southern District of New York has two people, a lawyer and a ex CFO, who are going to testify in, a, state's in evidence. front yeah. of a grand jury, if Elon Musk gets indicted, and I'm not saying that I know anything or think anything, I'm just saying this is, I like to play probabilities of of risk. This is an extinction risk for Elon Musk because he can't run Tesla if he's indicted. And I know that, oh, it's political. N and it nor SpaceX, I don't really care. nor Twitter, nor or X, and nor Well, he, you know, he can run, he can run X. Um, it's, it's a private company. He might have a problem with SpaceX because the government pays SpaceX and that could be another issue. Oh, okay. you, you mean he can't run it from a government subsidy standpoint? I just thought you meant from a capacity standpoint because it'll be in the Well, I mean, okay. you, you know, look, if, if if you're indicted, then, you know, listen, th if that happens, it's going to be, a, you know, the biggest story of the year or maybe the last 10 years of, in securities fraud or whatever. And they'll fight it and there'll be a long drawn out battle. But the fact is, it'll be it'll be a massive dis distraction for Elon with all the different companies that he has and the board may have to say you have to take a leave of absence mm -hmm. and and as much as it's a nothing burger and it, uh, some people have said oh he'll just settle they just pay a fine Martha Stewart got a phone call from her broker and said hey Sam Waxall the CEO of Imclom who you know and we're all friends just sold some stock I think you should sell some stock, Martha. She saved $20,000 by selling stock, paid a massive fine, and went to jail. So these people are very serious about what they right. do. And not and, jail, prison. I mean, she was. Yeah, well, yeah, she, prison. And she, but she did uh, lengthy I mean, look, time. I, it wasn't like she was in jail for a weekend. I mean, she was there for what, like a year or something like that? I Yeah, I mean, it was like six months, but still. You know, take they go after big whales. They went after Steve Cohen. And I, I will tell you this, I my old firm was sort of caught up in that insider trading thing that truth of the or end of the story, the the one partner of my firm was exonerated uh from any wrongdoing, which was a good thing. But they go after big whales and they'll they'll get the CFO or this attorney and say, look, you authorize these purchases. You're liable for jail. You could go to jail because of this unless you cooperate. So they'll get the, the smaller people below to go after the big whale. And that's that's how they got uh, uh, Mike Milken. That's how they, they get all of them. And because nobody wants to go to jail and they'll give up the, the person who doesn't really mean anything for them. I mean, it's all every man for themselves. So. Got it. This is so, just so a big risk. Yeah, you're saying they've got these demand problems you were talking about, but they also, on top of that, have this this government inquiry process that may finally, you know, prevent Elon from remaining Tesla and sorry, Elon from remaining Teflon, uh, and then he gets embroiled in this um, this whole thing, which who knows what could happen, but there is a chance that it could be very bad to your point, an extinction level event. Okay. So I do well, want to one, move on. One thing, one thing about, also, right? yeah. that's not my base case for being short. And, and it's not that I have anything, you know, against Elon Musk or any, and none of that. I love the, the Tesla cars. They're great. I'm a big fan of EVs. Uh, I think he runs things a little fast and loose, but my main focus of being short is market valuation and the demand drop off that is starting to happen. So that that's that's my base case. Okay. If this other thing happens, then you know, it, it, yay me. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so it's it's overly richly priced demand issue, and then the whole government wild card. Um, All right. So I like I said, I do want to get on to um, just your thoughts about sort of trading strategy given the markets the way they are. Real quick before we do, and keep it quick, just because we don't have a ton of time. 
Um, all right. So you've now gotten all the Apple bulls angry with us. Uh, now the, te the Tesla bulls are now angry with us. I know you've got some pretty strong thoughts about AI too. So why don't we just let everybody get in the angry pool for a moment? God, I, you know what? I, first of all, I, here's the other thing. I do turn bullish. And when I do turn bullish and I've been bullish on a lot of different things, um, I, it, Pays to listen, but I just I'm run I run basically a risk portfolio that I see risk, and I'm more than happy to short Apple uh, because I see the stock going down. I can't wait to buy it. Okay, let's just be very clear there. Uh, as far as AI, one thing that and look, I think the technology is really cool. The problem that I've seen is that we've seen several companies come out with very good earnings. Let's just go through it. Um, Nvidia. Oracle, Adobe, Microsoft. Um, there's probably a few others, but all those stocks have sort of peaked out right after earnings. And one of the problems that I, I see right now with AI is that the hype right now is very, very strong, or actually it's past hype, peak, peak hype. And a lot of those companies have said that their monetization with all the AI that they're implementing is a 2024 event. So that's what that's the the risk here is that it's gotten a little over itself ahead of itself I should say. And it's a 2024 event where they will be able to monetize this technology. So there you go. I'm bullish in 2024 let these things come down to reasonable levels and we'll buy them and we want to buy the best of the best and I do think Oracle I, I like Alphabet um, Microsoft, I, I, I think NVIDIA might be still way too rich, but I like the software names mostly. I, I, I think Adobe has really some interesting stuff. I mean, I, I I love the whole idea where they can create pictures if you just type in what you want. It's right. just amazing. Or even speak it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, give me this a picture of a monkey on the Empire State Building, you know, wearing a red hat. Bang. Yeah. Done. Boom. Done. Th it takes three seconds with Jerome Bell. Um, okay, <laughs> so uh, so now uh, you're going to get all the the Jerome Powell fans upset with you. You know, yeah, all, all one of them. I'm not too worried about <laughs> that game. Let's put it that way. Um, so you said you like the software companies. Let's put Nvidia aside for a second because I mean it's just price to fantasy to a certain extent. The the multiple to sales is mind boggling. Um, but for the, the other software companies you mentioned, the Adobe's, the Google's, the Microsoft's, Oracle. what type of price cooling off would you think you need to see to start to get attractive? 5%, 15% more? What, what, what What's going to catch your we've attention? Seen, we've seen on some of those more, more, much more than 10%. Yeah, I meant from here. I, yeah, I think I, I think we could see another 10 to 20% on some of okay. them. And okay. I, like Oracle's one that I'm starting to nibble on. I, I, I like that one uh, a lot. It's not necessarily just an AI play. I think they have very sticky business and it's very well run. So that's one I like. I think Adobe's still too high. I, I think that one needs to go down. That's the 20% lower that I'm not short, but I think it could. That's where I want to buy it down 20%. And Alphabet is probably one that will do well next year, maybe the premier company for AI, because they've been doing this for a long period of time and they they get data better than anybody and they know how to monetize it. Okay, so, um, so now moving to kind of, all right, investors. Okay, Tom just gave us a lot of information here. How do, how do we sort of think about all this? Um, you know, you just mentioned like, oh, you know, I think these stocks could do pretty well next year. I'm assuming that, statement takes as a given that uh, we, we haven't had kind of a breakage uh, event under these the high cost of, of capital that we have right now. And, you know, you were talking earlier where that, you know, hey, there's a chance that yields could go to, you know, five on the 30 year bond or higher than that, right, which would increase the odds of something systemic happening. So let, let me just ask you generally from a from a probability standpoint, what do you think is more likely? Do we continue through, you know, years of just kind of general investing from here, general investing conditions for the next couple of years? Or 
is is kind of playing the market right now. Um, some people have used the term on this channel often picking up nickels in front of a steamroller, you know, implying that the, the, the gains you get may not be worth the overall risk. I heard a, a really nice metaphor yesterday I'm going to steal, which is called, or, you know, is it like skiing in front of the avalanche? Right. Yeah. Um, so is it more like that or, or are you less worried about, um, you know, getting caught by some some big, massive downdraft and in, in, that takes both stocks and bonds down together? Well, I'm prepared for that. If that is the case, um, I'm positioned short. So if that is the case, um, I'm going to be I'm going to be fine. OK, so, so sorry to interrupt you, but, but that is you're saying that's like a hedge you've got, like you're you're concerned enough about it. That it's a hedge you have on your portfolio. Yeah, it's not no a hedge. It's, it's a directional bet. I'm directional. Di oh, so you short for you, this type? Does of that mean thing. you think it is fairly likely then in the next? Well, year let's. I don't like to say that we're going to have this cataclysmic type crash or anything like that. But if we have a ten percent pullback, which from here that would be something in the ballpark of around fifteen to twenty percent. It makes sense. I'm 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 fine with that. I just think that people are still not necessarily ready for that. I think there's so much passive money in the market that if they start to see some dislocation in the market, that's going to be a sell trigger for them because they they all. And the other thing is people have gains this year. Mm -hmm. You know, the S&P is still up, uh, I think, 11 percent. They still have gains and they can take profits. I'm going to take some profits. I'm going to take 10 percent off. I'm going to take 20 percent off. They still have gains. And it's when things go negative that it gets more dicey. And that I'm not necessarily saying we're going to go negative on the S&P for the year, but there's certainly no support underneath this market. And when you have more stocks going down than up, and then you have these generals that have had all this crowding into them, you start to see those give up and then we, we have a, a bigger problem. So that's, you know, it's the, the markets, um, I have a I have an index of the the uh, magnificent seven basket. Okay, those stocks, and then I have the four hundred ninety three stocks x that. That looks terrible, and it's basically flat for the year. Mm -hmm. So if you weren't in those seven stocks, and I wasn't, I was sure. So the S and P four ninety three has been flat. <laughs> yeah, I and and I look, I I got caught in June really off the the wrong side on some of them. And I, you know, happily admit, and I risk manage and I'm out of them and I'm short a few, but th now I am, but that's the risk that when you start to see things deteriorate, that's the problem. Here's the other little tip that I always tell people this, that are non-market participants. Like, when do I buy? I always get this. When do I buy? I said, when you see someone on the nightly news talk about the market going down. If you see that happen, that's probably a good sign that the markets are already down. I mean, it's sort of like the markets in turmoil with CNBC. When you see that happen, mm -hmm. it's the market should have been in turmoil, you know, at the highs. That's when you, you know, I I that's how I'm wired. So that's kind of what I want to see. And the other hand is if you see everybody making, you know, tons of money and your neighbor buys a Bentley, that's probably when you want to say, I think I need to lighten up it's just a different wiring that i have that i i sell i try to sell high and and buy low um when people are you know panicking the street on the upside and the and the downside yeah i had a friend uh just send me a a, a news article about i don't know if you remember the dogecoin millionaire but the guy that was you know in the media two years ago because he had basically put all his net worth in Dogecoin, which wasn't that much, but then the coin went bananas, right? right? He was worth like 3 million bucks. So now he's round tripped. I think he's back to like $30,000 with the entire holding. Hasn't sold a, a single Dogecoin yet, right? And my, my friend had said, you know, I actually went in on Dogecoin uh, at like seven cents and I, I, you know, I sold it at like 30 or something like that. And so I, you know, I made a nice little return on it, but, but they were more like you. They were the contrary where they're like, when I saw the article about that guy, you know, where they were talking about his 3 million, he was like, that's when I hit the sell button, right? Um, and of course, everybody that just waited for the headlines, you know, here we are two years later and they finally say, oh, by the way, Dogecoin's lost, you know, 90 whatever percent of its value over the past two years. Like, well, thanks for telling me now, right? Yeah, that that's that's actually, it, it's true. I remember two things. One, I remember I was on a 
airport uh, shuttle going to a rental car. And there was a guy on there talking about telling his girlfriend, uh, he was a, a airport worker and he was saying how he's, you know, next one's a doge coin and he's been buying Bitcoin and all these different things. And that was basically the top. And, and then the other one was the GameStop top. Mm-hmm. I had my daughter who's a film, who, she's graduated, but she was a film student in, in Dallas. She called me at the, and she's like, dad, what's going on with this GameStop? She goes, I have all these guys in my class. They're all talking about it. They're buying it. They're doing it. I said, that's it. So when the average person gets aware of what's happening in the market, whether it's on the downside or the upside, that's generally a very good general easy way of saying we're pretty close. That's a late cycle, you know, signal. Yeah, yeah. exactly. All right. Well, look, um, I, I'm going to say something that's going to be perhaps a bit self-serving for both you and, and for, for me uh, running wealthy on, which is I, I take a lot from what you've said. I'm just trying to condense it for the average viewer, um, which is, Hey, it, it, it's kind of treacherous and tumultuous out there right now. And there's an awful lot of potential downside risk. You know, we don't know exactly what's going to happen. You're definitely not saying the markets couldn't rally from here. In fact, you, you may be kind of expecting that a little bit in the short term. But it's sort of like this is not a, this is not a market for amateurs, right? That if you're like a regular person and, you know, have a real life to focus on and a job and a family, uh, it, it is probably better to be uh, following the the expertise of a real expert and and that's what's self-serving for you because you know you you have your hedge fund telemetry product where you're basically letting people look over your shoulder at everything that you're doing. Um, and then I would say not only you know getting good education and good information uh, from experts, but also following the guidance of a good professional financial advisor to take that information and make it actionable for you, given your specific financial situation, goals, risk tolerance, all that type of stuff, right? So uh, you're nodding as I'm saying all this. If you want to add anything to that, please do. But for folks that have really enjoyed this conversation and would like to follow you and your work, where should they go? Well, I'm on Twitter at Tommy Thornton. And I actually have my account locked right now. So that's that, uh, partly because I just had so much spam recently. But you can email me at info at hedgefundtelemetry.com. I run a website that is a newsletter. I put out three notes a day. I put out a weekly note, which is basically a summary of what's coming for the next week with some pretty important charts. I look at market sentiment. I look at the S&P, the NASDAQ. I have a trade ideas section that has a long short portfolio so you can reach uh take a look at hedgefundtelemetry.com and if anybody's interested in taking a trial you can email me again info at hedgefundtelemetry.com if you want to subscribe you can subscribe the annual rate is 750 a year and if you use the code second half with an s or sorry two um second half of you get 250 off the annual rate. So I'd love to have more people. I give everybody a free book on DeMarc indicators when they sign up, uh, just so they get up to speed. I try to do as much education as possible. I'm very, very diligent about position sizing. And if someone's just there and they're, they're managing their own money, the main thing that I try to tell people every single time I, I have a conversation with a new investor or someone that's even very sophisticated, Having that diversification, having position size limits will save you uh, from blowing up or, you know, having some real, you know, drawdown. And don't be afraid to take some cash and, and or some of your money and put it into cash. You get a yield now for cash, which is sort of a nice thing. Um, so just wait for those opportunities uh, to, to present themselves. It's time right now to be very, very patient. Okay. Great, great way to end. Time to be very, very patient. Uh, presumably, uh, not a time to stretch for excessive speculation. Um, all right, you mentioned it really briefly, so I'll just give you a few seconds to say anything you want about it. But apparently, you now have a hedge fund again. I do. I do have a, a small hedge fund. Uh, some of my friends uh, have given me money, and I'm very, very uh, excited about it. It's a long, short fund. It basically is very similar to what I do with the trade ideas sheet on our website. So it's, uh, it's similar, but there's a little, 
differences here and there, and I'm pretty excited about it. I just started it in, in August, and knock on wood, I'm up already, and in a down market, that's kind of what I want to do. Is it open to interested investors who might want to learn more about it, or is this just closed between you and your friends? If someone's an accredited investor, they can reach out on my email, and we can have a conversation. Okay, great. All right. Well, look, in wrapping it up here, folks, just want to give two quick resources before you go. Obviously, go to uh, Tommy's website there. Uh, I'm a subscriber. One of the things I really like about it, Tommy, is um, you've got great data, obviously, and you've, you've shown us you know, the data that you look at, but your your um, updates that you send throughout the day, you send a couple updates, not, not too many, but you kind of bullet point in the email your kind of top thoughts of what's going on right then, given the market activity. So it's fun because it only takes me five seconds, literally, to just open the email, see what you're thinking, and then I can go on about my day, right? If I want to dig into it further, I can. But it's just kind of like you just coming to me two, three times a day and saying, hey, here's what I see going on right now. And that's really valuable for me to be able to get that view for your eyes through the day. Um, all right. So folks, real quick, um, the Wealthy on Fall online conference uh, is still very much uh, being held next month, Saturday, October 21st. If you can't attend live, don't worry. Everyone who registers will get emailed replay videos of the event, both the full presentations as well as the live Q&A. Uh, to learn more about the event, it's our best faculty ever so far. Go to wealthion.com slash conference while you can still get the 29% early bird discount. That's our greatest price discount. It's going to expire relatively soon. And if you're an alumnus, check your email. You'll have a code from me that'll give you an additional 15% discount on top of that 29% discount. Um, and just wrapping up too, as I intimated earlier and say every, every video here, um, if you are looking for help from a good professional financial advisor who takes into account all the macro issues that, that Tom and I have talked about here, uh, consider scheduling a free consultation with one of the financial advisors endorsed by Wealthion. To go do that, just go to Wealthion.com, fill out the short form there, only takes a couple of seconds, doesn't cost you anything, no commitment to work with these guys. It's just a free public service that our uh, financial advisors offer the public to help as many people as possible position as prudently as possible before some of the eventualities or, or the uh, potentialities that Tom's mentioned for us here. Uh, if you've enjoyed having Tom on, the Tom on the channel, would like to have him come back on and bring even more charts in the future, please cast your vote in support of that by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Tom, I can't thank you enough. Another great discussion. Uh, thanks for being so transparent with all of your analysis. I'll let you have the parting word here for folks. Well, I'd just like to say thank you, Adam. I love coming on and having a conversation with you. It's just, it's loose. It's easy. We can kind of go through a lot of different things. The, the format's great, but I, I will say I am a subscriber to your channel and I watch most of all the video. Well, most of your videos, when they come out, you have great guests. You, you ask great questions, which elicit great answers that are actionable. So I just want to say thank you and congratulations to you. I, I'm just I'm thrilled for you and all your success. Uh, so just uh, thank you for having me on. I really, really appreciate it. You're more than welcome. That is hugely humbling to hear. Thank you, folks. I swear I didn't realize he was going to give me uh, nice props like that. I, I thought he was going to talk about his services that he totally deserves having you uh, go check them out. But but Tom, thanks so much. And look, you've got a, a, a open door to come back on this channel anytime you're seeing something in your analysis where you've got an important message that you want to get out in the world. Um, thank you so much, my friend. It's just been a true pleasure. Everyone else, thanks so much for watching.